In 1964, Smokey Eunuch unveiled a machine that defied symmetry, logic, and racing tradition, the capsule car. Born from the skies of World War II and inspired by a German warplane's odd design, it promised perfect balance and radical speed. At Indianapolis, it rolled out like a challenger from another world, daring the speedway itself to accept or destroy it. What followed became legend, a tale of brilliance, audacity, and downfall, the Skyborne vision. The year was 1944, and the skies over Europe roared with thunder not born of storms, but of men's machines. Smokey Eunuch, still young but already tempered by fire, guided his B-17 flying fortress through a haze of flak and tracer rounds. Around him, the engines sang their strained metallic hymn as the bomb bay opened to reveal Germany below. The air was thick with death, yet amid the chaos, Smokey's eyes caught something strange. Cutting through the clouds like a phantom, a German reconnaissance plane crossed his path. But this was no ordinary Luftwaffe craft. Its silhouette seemed wrong, almost broken. A fuselage stretched along one line, but its cockpit jutted out like an outrigger, perched asymmetrically on the side as though torn from reason itself. This was the Blohm and Voss BV-141, an anomaly of aeronautical design, mocked by some engineers but terrifyingly functional in its own right, Smokey was transfixed. In the split seconds he had to observe, a seed took root. The idea that machinery need not conform to symmetry, that balance could be struck not through convention, but through clever rearrangement, lodged itself in his mind. As he returned to base, his B-17 riddled with holes and the war grinding onward, he carried that image with him. Long after the war's smoke cleared, long after he traded the skies for the grease and grit of American garages, that odd German aircraft still lingered like a ghost in his imagination. Smoky Eunuch would not be defined by convention. He would bend the rules, bend the materials, bend even the imagination of racing itself. And from the skies of Europe, an idea was born that would someday take shape on the sacred grounds of Indianapolis. The capsule takes form. Two decades later, Daytona Beach shimmered in the spring sun. Along the banks of the Halifax River, where seagulls wheeled and the smell of salt and oil mingled, Smoky Eunuch's workshop thrummed with activity. This was no ordinary garage. This was a temple of invention, a place where the impossible was stripped down to bolts and steel, then reborn as reality. Here stood Smokey, gruff, unshaven, his eyes sharp with mischief and brilliance. To the world, he was already legendary, a mechanic, a driver, a dreamer, and a fighter. But now, in 1964, he prepared to unveil his boldest creation yet. Beside him, George Hurst, the shifter king of American hot-rodding, posed proudly. He had put his fortune behind this strange experiment. Forty thousand dollars to carry his name onto the brickyard at Indianapolis. And behind them, glinting under the sun, sat a machine unlike any race car the Speedway had ever seen, the capsule car. At first glance, it seemed almost alien. A central fuselage ran straight and true, housing the drivetrain, the engine, and the bones of the beast. But the driver? He did not sit within that spine. No. His cockpit was hung to the left side, like a pod, a sidecar welded to destiny itself. Smokey had done it deliberately. The three greatest weights, engine, driver, and fuel, were balanced so that as the laps wore on and the fuel drained, the car would remain constant a machine of perfect equilibrium, its mass poised to devour the corners of Indianapolis with precision. Smokey had wanted more. A turbine engine, a whirring helicopter heart, had been his dream power source. But when that deal dissolved, he reached for the tried and tested, a four-cylinder Offenhauser. Not flashy, but loyal, with long intake trumpets jutting forward like the snouts of some predator. They whispered of mid-range torque, of calculated strength rather than brute force. The details fascinated even more. A transverse monoleaf spring doubled as a suspension link, Pontiac Tempest brakes, cheap and light, adorned the front with finned aluminum drums. In the rear, a Dedion tube, coilover shocks, trailing arms, 
all tied together in a tubular space frame. Each decision was deliberate, chosen for balance, for ingenuity, for the audacity to be different. And then there was the cockpit itself, narrow, tight, and almost perilous. A squared-off steering wheel to spare the driver's knees. A strange shifter and clutch combined in one lever, fashioned from Hearst's signature expertise, Smokey even dreamed of a single pedal to command both throttle and brake, though practicality eventually broke that fantasy. Five bolts alone held the driver pod to the chassis, an engineering curiosity that sent shivers through the rule makers of U.S. Ace. To pilot such a contraption, Smokey needed more than a driver. He needed someone who was daring yet steady, brave yet calm. He chose Bobby Johns, a NASCAR warrior, son of Shorty Johns, who had tasted victory on the stock car ovals yet never braved the bricks of Indianapolis, Bobby would be the chosen one, the rookie knight armed with this outlandish steed. But Bobby was not alone in his initiation. Veteran Dwayne Carter, a man who had driven Smokey's machines before, took laps as well, feeling the strange weight and balance of the creation. His hands had once tamed Smokey's reverse torque special at Indy in 1959. Now he tested the pod racer as the whispers around Gasoline Alley grew. Some called it genius. Others called it madness. The capsule car divided men the way fire divides shadow and light. Yet there it was, gleaming, humming, ready to attempt its destiny on the stage where legends were made and broken. The month of May drew on, and the speedway brimmed with speed and danger. The capsule car fought its way through the new car bugs that plague all experimental beasts. Every lap was a gamble, every tweak a desperate bid to align Smokey's vision with reality. Time slipped away, and with it, patience. At last, on the final day, Sunday, May 24, 1964, the car rolled forward to attempt qualification. The crowd's murmurs rose, curious eyes drawn to the odd silhouette of Smokey's invention. The green flag waved. Bobby Johns pressed forward, the offy snarling to life, its cylinders echoing through the canyon of grandstands. For a moment, it seemed as if Smokey's dream might indeed take wing. The capsule car thundered toward turn one, the crowd leaning in as the pod and fuselage carved into speed. But the speedway is no friend to the untested, and destiny had sharp edges waiting at the corner. The fall at turn one. The crowd hushed as the capsule car hurtled toward destiny. The Offenhauser's growl echoed off the walls, its voice deep and steady, but beneath that note lurked uncertainty. Smokey Eunuch stood near pit lane, arms folded, eyes narrowed. He had faced combat in the skies, stared down death at 30,000 feet, but this moment felt no less perilous. His invention was on the edge of proving itself, or collapsing in ridicule. Bobby John sat low in the sidecar pod, his hands gripping the squared steering wheel with a mix of calm and apprehension. For weeks he had wrestled with this machine, coaxing it to speed, feeling its quirks. The balance was uncanny, the positioning strange. Every lap was a conversation with physics, as though the car whispered, I am different, learn me or perish. The first lap began smooth. The capsule car surged past the bricks, its left bias weight settling into rhythm. The fans, skeptical at first, watched as the strange creation sliced the straightaway. The engine sang, the tires gripped, and Bobby leaned into turn one with the courage of a man trying to carve his name into history. But then came the flaw, the brakes. Smokey had chosen Pontiac Tempest drums, cheap, light, clever. But cleverness can betray. Until warmed, they were unpredictable, prone to snatching, grabbing with sudden violence. As Bobby approached turn one, speed pressing against his chest, he felt the corner rush up too quickly. Instinct took over. He tapped the brake, and the car betrayed him. The pedal answered not with restraint, but with fury. The drums bit too hard, too fast. The capsule car snapped sideways, weight surging, balance unraveling in an instant. Metal shrieked as tires lost grip. One spin, two spins. The car twisted violently, a blur of white and black across the pavement. A full 720 degrees. The crowd gasped as the pod swung outward, Bobby's body jostled like a rag in a storm. 
For an instant, the vision of the BV-141, that German plane with its outrigger cockpit, replayed in Smokey's mind. But this was no reconnaissance flight. This was a death dance on asphalt. The left side slapped the outside wall. Sparks flew as steel kissed concrete. The capsule car shuddered, then fell silent, nose pointing awkwardly toward the infield. Dust and smoke hung in the air as medics rushed forward. In the cockpit, Bobby Johns sat stunned but alive. Luck, perhaps Providence, had spared him. The crash was relatively gentle compared to the brutal wrecks the Speedway often claimed. But the lesson was clear. His helmet bobbed as he climbed from the pod, shaking his head, alive but shaken, his chance at glory shattered. In the pits, Smokey exhaled slowly, his jaw clenched. His dream, so close to breathing life into the record books, now lay broken against the wall. The qualifying clock ticked mercilessly onward, time evaporating like mist under sunlight. The mechanics rushed, but repairs were impossible in the dwindling hours. The capsule car's month was over, yet the wreck revealed more than a failed attempt. The replay of the spin showed the vulnerability no one could ignore. The driver, sitting exposed in his pod, had been tossed like a doll, arms flailing against restraints. What if the impact had been harder? What if another car had struck? The vision of equilibrium and balance was undeniable, but the risk, it screamed louder than the Offenhauser ever could. The speedway is a crucible. It burns away illusions, leaving only what can endure. And in that fire, Smokey's capsule car found no mercy. Still, Smokey Eunuch was not the kind of man to weep over failure he had lost before, and he had lost bigger. What mattered was the idea, the boldness, the willingness to challenge the order of things. The capsule car had shown its teeth. Now the rulemakers took note. In the aftermath, whispers spread across Gasoline Alley. Some laughed, calling it Smokey's sidecar, the pod racer, a contraption better suited for carnival tracks than the hallowed grounds of Indy others, respected the sheer audacity. To tear down convention and rebuild it in this way, this was the mark of a true innovator, whether or not the attempt succeeded. But bureaucracy has a way of ending experiments faster than failure. By the next year, new rules would close the door on designs like Smokey's safety concerns, technical stipulations, the tightening grip of regulation. They sealed the capsule car's fate before it could ever return to battle. For Smokey, it was another chapter in a life written not in neat lines, but in bold strokes and sudden turns. He had stood against giants before, car companies, sanctioning bodies, even the laws of physics themselves. Sometimes he won, sometimes he fell short, but he never stopped trying. As for the capsule car, its destiny was not to win on the track, but to endure in memory. The crash of May 24, 1964, would be its only race, its only attempt at glory. Yet that attempt would echo whispered about in garages, debated in museums, remembered not as a joke, but as a symbol of how far a man might go when he dares to see the world differently. Smokey Eunuch walked away from that May, with his reputation intact, his vision sharpened, and his resolve unbroken. The capsule car, bent and battered, would find a second life not on asphalt, but behind glass, in the museum where machines live forever. But in that moment, Standing in the twilight of the speedway, the dream unfinished, Smokey knew he had brushed the edge of revolution, and revolutions do not die easily. Exile to glass and memory. The capsule car never again roared at speedway pace. The crash of May 24, 1964, had sealed its racing fate, and the sanctioning body's rule changes a year later buried the concept beneath bureaucracy. It was as if the authorities feared not just the car's quirks, but the dangerous potential of ideas like Smokey's, ideas that bent tradition until it cracked. So the car was rolled back into Smokey's workshop in Daytona Beach, where the smell of salt water and machine oil lingered in the air. For a while, it sat quiet, a mute witness to its own failure. Mechanics glanced at it like one might a wounded animal, knowing it would never again hunt. Its tubular bones still gleamed, 
its sidecar pod still perched defiantly to the left, as though daring anyone to call it obsolete. Smokey moved on to other battles. He was never one to dwell too long on the past. His garage continued to hum with life, stock cars, open-wheel machines, engines that twisted rules and redefined possibilities. Yet the capsule car remained in the corner, its presence heavy. It was not a defeated machine, not in Smokey's eyes. It was an unfinished thought, paused in mid-sentence. Then came the decision. Smokey eunuch, perhaps realizing that the car would never see competition again, turned it over to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's Hall of Fame Museum. It was an act of surrender, but also of preservation. If the capsule car could not race, it would at least stand eternal as a symbol, a reminder of what audacity looked like when forged in steel. Behind the glass walls of the museum, it found a second life. Fans and historians walked past, their eyes drawn to the odd profile, the sidecar cockpit, the exposed vulnerability of the design. Some laughed, some marveled, some lingered long in thought. Children tugged at their parents' hands, asking why the car looked so strange, why the driver sat off to the side, and their parents, fumbling for an answer, often fell silent, realizing they were staring at something that was not just a car, but a question made into metal. The capsule car was no longer a competitor. It was a monument. But monuments, like dreams, have power. And Smokey Unix machine continued to whisper across decades, what if? The eternal question. Years passed. The world of racing marched on. Wings sprouted on Indy cars, then vanished, then returned in new shapes. Turbines came and went, engines shrank and swelled, and technology leapt forward. But no one ever built another car quite like Smokey's capsule. And yet, the ghost of the idea lingered. For those who stood before it in the museum, the question was inescapable. Had it been ahead of its time, could it have worked if given more laps, more testing, more patience? Was Smokey's vision of balance and weight distribution truly genius, or was it a blind alley masquerading as innovation? Smokey himself, in later years, seemed to embrace the ambiguity. He was never a man to beg for validation. His memoirs brimmed with stories of triumphs, failures, scams, and miracles, but he spoke of the capsule car with a mix of pride and bemusement. It had been his dare to the world, and the world had blinked. And still, whispers remained. Engineers in quiet corners of workshops would sketch the sidecar layout on napkins, wondering if with modern materials, modern safety, modern brakes, the concept might thrive. Aerodynamicists staring at wind tunnel data occasionally glanced toward the capsule car's asymmetry and wondered if Smokey's madness might one day be reborn as brilliance. The car itself sits silent, but the spirit it carries is anything but dead. For innovation does not vanish simply because a wall was kissed in 1964, innovation sleeps, waiting for another bold hand to shake it awake. And so the capsule car waits, perched in its museum, gleaming under lights, its pod jutting defiantly outward as though leaning into a turn it will never complete. Visitors stare, whisper, move on. But sometimes a child stops and lingers, eyes wide, mind racing. That child does not see failure. That child sees possibility. The question hangs, unresolved. What if someone tried again? This is Paul from Rare Car Stories. Catch you next time.